minutes. I know there's only two of you right now. And we have, thank you, Chris from Quali for being here to yeah. be one of the uh, companies from our, one of our, what was it, our 2020 cohort? representing yeah. yeah 2020 coach so you're now in uh you know you're one of those legacy companies now you're, you're i know yeah it's like we're in the closing yeah closing stretch of our participation so. yeah yeah um so today what we're gonna do and i think um we can i, I want to switch up a couple things but what i want to do for today is i briefly just go, uh, go over sift start intro sift start um i'll go over our the benefits of the program you know going through like education mentorships conferences you name it talk about that um and then what i want to do is pass it over to chris and let him you know intro quality and then give his perspective on their participation and what they've gotten and you know um talk about um Civ start from their point of view um and then I'll talk about the structure in terms of the financial structure of this arrangement. And then we'll open it up for Q&A. Does that work? Yep. And if anyone else joins later, um, we'll share this with them. And, um, and this is being recorded, so we're OK. Awesome. So hi, everyone. I'm Anthony Jamison. I am the CEO and one of the co-founders of Sivstart. Today, I have two of my colleagues here, Jessica and Nick. Both of them are with Civs. Um, Nick is one of the co-founders. Jessica leads our, um, our um, communications and community, not commun communications, our community. I'm, I, I just always conflate the two. Uh, <laughs> she leads our, she's our community manager there. So um, if you're in our program, you will get a, a heavy dose of Jessica there. Um, um, in the, the, in the engagement. And so just really briefly about Civstart, we're a nonprofit. We're based here in Washington, DC. Our team is all over the place, but that's we are headquartered here in DC. Um, we started off as an accelerator, but we're more of like an innovation hub. But I'm going to talk mostly about the acceleration portion of the organization, which is the most important thing to you. Um, our main focus is on state and local government. That's all we put our time and effort into. Um, our goal is to build an honest and inclusive ecosystem of government leaders and startup solutions that serve their communities. Um, and so our program is a two-year program. Um, the reason it's two years, because we want to, there's a couple things. One, we want to mimic the extremes of the cell cycle within local government. There, it, some, there, sometimes when you're talking to um, uh, a locality, there can be opportunities that last a year or two, and, or maybe never even come to fruition. So we want to make sure that you have a better understanding of like uh, of like what that can look like, but we want to also support you through that entire process. Um, and and for those two years, we want to be hands on. That's the main thing. We really want to be hands on. We our goal is to build more partners and not vendors. We want you to be seen in a different light um, to these uh, government officials in these localities than what they look at when they think about technology solutions. Um, uh, we, I, while we mostly focus on, um, te uh, technology, like, uh, software, um, we definitely have some solutions that are not, um, software related. We have some that are a blend of software, hardware, some that are just hardware, right? We have a ride sharing company with an EV ride sharing company. Um, uh, we have a, uh, a company that puts out um, low atmosphere balloons to do um, high quality imaging. Um, so it, it's a variety. The way we select the startups in this program, it's not between the team here at CivStart or anything like that. We have a selection committee, mostly made up of public sector and some private sector folks as well, some investors that will review the applications when they come in. And then they will give, uh, they will rank them. And based on that criteria, those are the startups that move forward 
into the inter, um, interview process. And then we conduct the interviews and we get we provide a report back to um, our board. And then our board from that, from the, those, uh, from those, from that report, then the select, the final selections are made there. So it's a, I would take it as a good thing when you make it past the, the initial selection um, process, because that means like at least some governments understood and know what you do, and they think it's needed for this market, right? Um, and so, uh, once you're in our program, we do have a variety of different things that we provide to you, and I'll get into the benefits of the program itself, but some of the traditional um, uh, accelerator benefits that you'll get, but we try to stay away from, we're not here to help you, um, while we will, we're not here like the other accelerators when it comes to building the ins and outs of your business. Our goal is to help you navigate this landscape, this this, and understand how to work with local governments, understand opportunities to put you in a position to win opportunities, to um, um, to um, help you build your brand and um, scale within the market. Um, and so we do have um, one thing I do want to share is that we do have a variety of partnerships and relationships with. Um, organizations that do help us do things like sell into governments. We work with associations like the National League of Cities or ELGO, which is um, the um, Engaging Local Government Leaders Association. Those are some significant orgs. We do have some partnerships. Well, we do receive funding from groups like, Kauf like Kauffman Foundation, which uh, which allow us to partner directly with cities and counties to um, do some pilot programs and match startups within our programs up with those uh, localities. Um, so yeah, that is just a quick overview of CivStart. Um, um, and before, actually before I go, I know we have questions again, before I go, I'll let Dustin and Christine, um, if you guys have any questions about anything I just said, um, feel free to ask. Yep, no questions so far. Okay. And Nick, if I missed anything, feel free to add anything in terms of our- no, I think that was good. Start. Yeah. All right, and so I'm getting into the benefits of the program. Like I said, the program is two years long. Um, we're very hands-on. You do not have to be in DC. Um, we do not make that a requirement just because we know that you're all, all very busy and the last thing we want to do is put another barrier up for you to be able to execute on delivering your fine solutions to these uh, municipalities. And so the things that we provide are we do provide education and when I say education, again, we are focused on state and local government. And so if that's dealing with education and procurement, if that's like looking at the beginning stages of like um, engaging a procurement office officer or purchasing, or if that's looking at co-ops, or if that is um, helping you make sure that you're Fed rep compliant or whatever, we do work within that entire sphere of um, we'll we'll touch on all those different issues. Um, we do have, in terms of our education, we like to bring in governments maybe once a month. We're trying to get it to twice a month. We'll bring in a different government leader that'll come and give we, what we call our, we have gov, we call them gov talk, talks, and they come in and they give an overview of their, their community. If it's a city or if it's county, this is what we're doing here of our pressing challenges. And it allows you all to really spend some time with them and and get to know them and share what you're and, and ask them probing questions and see if there's an opportunity for you to work with them down the line. So it's a really, we, we like that as a, we look at it as a very safe space for these governments to come and talk to many of you and for them to be willing to open up. And if they want to move forward with something with you, they have the ability to do that. Um, we do provide uh, mentorship. We have, once you are selected to be a part of our program, um, we have a 
large list of mentors based on where you are in your cycle or in your life cycle. Um, we will um, we will recommend up to three mentors that will follow you through your journey through our program. They can, uh, you know, the mentors can be focused on anything from marketing to networking to fundraising to um, to product development. Um, uh, communications, you name it, right? We even have, we have several government officials that are mentors that will be, they're great sounding boards. Some, sometimes it turns into something if you're working with, um, depending on, depending on what you're doing, if you're, uh, have one of these governments as a mentor. Um, but the, these mentors are people that will help you through your entire, uh, process, um, or your, in, through the entire program. Um, while you're engaged with us. Um, we do have, I wanna jump into, um, we conferences and partnerships. So one way, one thing I wanna stress is that we are not a selling organization. Our goal is not to go out and sell your solution, right? Um, what we do, we, we do it in a different way. We do sell, in a, in a in more of an educational manner than go we're not cold calling we're not gonna you're, you're not gonna give us a hundred governments to go after and we're just gonna start ringing the door and saying hey buy this buy this buy this that doesn't help you that doesn't help us our goal is to go out and build relationships with all these different governments and and and, and educate them on what's out there and help them understand how to be innovative and and augment we work with a lot of different cities and counties where we will augment their smart cities or smart counties teams and we will basically sit in those um, agencies and help them source solutions for particular challenges we teach them how to write challenge statements so that they can put out more favorable rfps for startups um, as I was sharing earlier, we have that relationship with the Kauffman Foundation where we take on a, a cohort of cities every year. We have our own program, our state and local government innovation program, where we pick a different issue area and we take on a cohort of cities and counties and we uh, and then we put them through a, a similar program and then match up startups there as well to do pilot, um, as Quali can attest to. Sometimes these usually don't turn into pilots, they turn into contracts. <laughs> we, we try to push them to do pilots, but a lot for some reason, a lot of these governments are just like, if we're going to implement it, we might as well just pay for it versus, uh, you know, rolling it back down the line. Um, but the way we do, the way we help you generate leads is we have relationships with all these different organizations. We give you either free tickets to like conferences like the National Association of Counties or the National League of Cities or ELGO or things like that. Or, and there's some other orgs that we don't have, we don't get free tickets, but we get significant discounts like the Smart Cities Connect Conference. That conference can run like $1,500 a ticket and we can get I forget we were get we were, we got our tickets for like dirt cheap right for you all right really affordable and so we do things like that um we um we do have partnerships with other larger corporations we they'll cut a lot like aws esri um um uh, who's an, a, another good example there's like the etnas of the world or whoever they these companies want to come to us so they can work closely with startups like yourselves. Um, if they're looking for either partnership opportunities, because they are already they're already in these communities and they're looking to expand, or if they're looking for like I'll use the company like AWS for example, they're looking for opportunities to use you to sell into communities because you're built on their solution, or if it's um, or if it's um, an, uh, an M&A opportunity, right? A lot of these uh, uh, companies do come to us to see if there's an opportunity for them to actually acquire some of you. And we've actually had about three acquisitions in the last year happen. Um, we, uh, the other thing when it comes to sales, we, we don't like to do one to one on one things too much so unless there's like an obvious opportunity or if it's something that we are um, 
um, actively pursuing if we see something, but we do let lots of one to many um, activities. We'll do a lot, of, we'll do webinars, we'll do focus groups, we do um, networking activities um, where we invite governments to come participate in certain things. Even investors, we help you when it comes to an, um, securing funding. Um, if it's whatever stage, you know, we work with VCs, we work with impact funds, we work with foundations, you name it. We run a whole gambit there. Um, we can do surveys out to a large um, to um, uh, a large amount of governments as well. We'd like to focus on an issue though, not just a particular solution because we gather that information, provide you with information that allows you to appropriately go after those opportunities. Um, and then, um, yeah, what we like to do is we sit down, we build out a plan with each one of the, each company that's in the program. Um, and we try to, everyone's plan is different. It's catered towards your needs. If it's focused on, if it's focused on, um, let's say if it's focused on, hey, we want to build our, we're, we're trying to really grow our brand in this, uh, in the, um, in the county and city space, or, hey, we really, really want to roll out this new product, but we need to get more feedback from these target targeted personas. So we want to conduct X amount of focus groups, or we want to put out some type of, um, we have one startup right now, we're working on putting out a, a workforce report with them and some other um, leaders in this space um, that will help them achieve some of their like um, milestones that they have um, with some of their funders. So there's a, a large swath of benefits that we provide, and there's probably some things I even missed, but what I'm gonna do right now is stop, because I just throw a lot at you all, see if there's any questions there, um, and then I will hand it off to Quali after that. So any questions? Um, I do have a question. Mm -hmm. um, how do you typically handle um, you know, firms that work with the consulting model. Um, yeah, because I, I don't do a lot of accelerators. I do some mentoring programs, but when it comes to kind of like startup accelerators, they really work in that product mm -hmm. model rather than the consulting model. So mm -hmm. I wonder how do you handle that and have you had? So when you say consulting model, right? Because we do have a couple of startups that we work with that, are more of like consulting design teams more than they they don't have one product they create depends on who they're working with mm -hmm. um um like um, um uh if it's what's i it, think um, what's civis analytics might be a good example no no what's the uh what's the other one engage like, stay the one is, Oh, it's the one based in California, Exigy. Exigy. That was, there we go, Exigy. You know, like they're like a consulting team, but if a government comes to them and say, hey, we want a housing solution for this, and then they focus on developing a housing solution. They have a housing solution, right? And mm -hmm. that's what, so we do work with, one of our new ones is, like Nick just said, is um, Engage, which is kind of like a quasi consulting developer firm, mm -hmm. not a they don't have one specific solution or overarching theme that they focus on, which is a gift and a curse, right? Because like you can be, you can do everything, but then you also are like trying, you're going after, you're spreading yourself, you're going after every opportunity, right? Yeah. So it's like, what do you want to focus on? And so mm -hmm. that's what we try to do when we work with organizations like that is trying to find one or two areas that we're going to focus on based on what we have strong, where we have a strong footprint, mm -hmm. where we have our expertise and knowledge, or even like our mentors or other partners expertise to knowledge where we can help you the most. Got it. Um, I'm particularly interested in community engagement. That's one of our strong okay. areas. That's a very strong. <laughs> um, and just wanting to learn how to develop my company so that I can grow beyond North Carolina. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm particularly interested in developing processes so that other organizations and municipalities can also do adopt our engagement model. Mm -hmm. So that's what I'm looking to do, but I, you know, I'm like really hesitant 
to look at an accelerator unless, you know, unless there are mentors or advisors that have done, you know, it's, it's the company model rather than pushing a product. Yeah, no, I get it. And I'm saying like, yeah, that's, that is in our wheelhouse. Um, that's something we work on and we, and especially when it's in community engagement, you know, we got, I think like four or five community engagement type solutions in our, in our space that we work with. So, yeah. Great. Any other questions? I had a question um, yes. regarding the, I, I know you don't, you're saying you don't sell or you don't push any particular kind of solution, but as we're working together and you're seeing viable opportunities in the government space, is the predominant way of facilitating those, you know, engagements or meetings uh, and then securing maybe some work together in that space through RFPs? So we do not want to do RFPs. We try to stay away from RFPs as much as possible. All right. And when I say we don't push, like we will push the solutions that are in our program. What I'm saying is that we're just not going to just start calling, cold calling people for you. Right. But if we see opportunities, we will try to work with the government and you to try to see how we can facilitate getting something move forward. If that's them tapping into discretionary spending, if that's, you know, they might have money set aside from some they like, allocated because of this is a strategic goal of theirs already that they've already had money set aside for. So we will do things like that. We're just not going to just be, I don't want you all thinking that we're a sales force for you, right? We're not, we're not going to get on the street and do that type of stuff, but we will sell you through the education model, right? Through, hey, come listen to our community engagement solutions around how we can reach X, Y, and Z individuals, right? Um, we'll do things like that. But when it comes to RFPs, we try to stay um, unless the RFP is written for you, it's a waste of time. Unless, like, you might win them, right? But do you well, want to really? I guess really that's kind of my, my question. Um, because, yes, they, they need to be written so narrowly that it basically points to you as the solution yeah. that trying, you know, to go for. And we're, we're um, technology, we have our proof of concept in housing. Um, mm -hmm. We have application to other sectors, but haven't, you know, we've had lots of requests for applying it to agriculture, haven't gone there yet, but just focusing on housing at the moment, um, you know, I've had conversations with HUD already, you know, the digital director for HUD and, you know, different people within HUD, super excited about what we're doing, have said that they need what it is that we've built, mm -hmm. but it's like, what's, what's the way in, if not by RFP, what other so yeah so the way we usually do it is through pilots and i and i think it'll, this is a pretty good segue into chris and quali's um experience yeah, absolutely. And how we've done things so i think nancy once chris after chris um gives his overview and perspective if you have questions around that still yeah. then i'm happy to answer awesome thanks Awesome. Well, um, yeah, I'll give a super short introduction and then go straight into sort of answering your question, Nancy. Um, so uh, my name is Chris Amundsen, co-founder and CEO at Quali. Uh, we're a software platform for cities and local governments and local government adjacent organizations uh, like economic development uh, organizations or chambers of commerce to uh, better engage with and support uh, local entrepreneurs and small businesses um, to help them navigate various government processes like business licensing or permitting or uh, even procurement, um, things of that nature. So um, that's kind of the, the short description of what we do. Um, I think, yeah, to speak to kind of what, um, what Anthony has been talking about with um, sort of how, how it all goes down, I guess, uh, and, and how it's worked. So we've uh, been in the program uh, for almost two years now. Um, so we're about to about to graduate, I guess. Um, and uh, one particular partnership program that's been really beneficial um, that sort of Sivstart, uh, you know, uh, engaged with uh, was the NLC and Kaufman program uh, that a Anthony mentioned, the City Innovation Ecosystem Program. Um, so we've actually uh, gotten three separate contracts with three different cities and three different states uh, through that program directly and probably adding a fourth uh, here shortly. Um, and the way that that has kind of worked is it's um, 
it's a little bit of um, the cities are joining this program because they're trying to understand sort of what are their problem areas and what are problem areas that they have that are really ripe for technology or uh, you know new services or new offerings that are coming along. Um, and so folks at CivSart are really helping those governments kind of just kind of grapple with that and understand kind of what their problems are and sort of, you know, really focusing first on sort of solving the problem and not just like picking a solution. Um, but there is, you know, generally like a natural tendency of, uh, you know, at some point it is uh, sort of clear that, oh yeah, this problem that, you know, we could take, um, you know, um, the, the city of Manor, Texas, which is a small suburb outside of Austin. Um, they were a member of this program that we started working with. Um, kind of their challenge was they're such a small uh, town with a small government, but they were growing at a kind of breakneck speed that they couldn't really, their challenge was they couldn't really keep up with um, sort of the demand for providing kind of support and technical assistance to uh, anyone who was trying to kind of start or grow a business there. Um, and so kind of once the folks that start kind of realize that, I think they sort of, you know, kind of started shaping um, the opportunity there a little bit. Um, and it was sort of a natural fit of, you know, we're sort of uh, in the program and sort of a pre-vetted solution um, that works. Um, and then, you know, they make an introduction um, uh, of us to them. And, you know, was, we probably had two or three meetings uh, with, with at least with each city um, in this program, um, sort of before we even started talking about exact kind of contract terms or things of that nature. Um, so it's a little bit of like, there's different ways. It's not necessarily like, you know, mainlining an RFP for you uh, and, and what you're trying to do, but it's, um, you know, definitely like in, in sort of that providing that, so start providing that education piece and just sort of highlighting some options and alternatives for the cities. Um, usually that's enough to, to kind of get, get folks at a city interested. If your product is, you know, does solve that problem and you can kind of demonstrate and point to success you've had previously, um, you know, all, the hardest part about this, you know, this whole space is just getting that first customer. Uh, and once you have that and you can refer back to that and say, oh yeah, it worked here, it worked there. Even if it's just one, that's, I think that's what we've found is that was, that's all you need to really get going, you know? Um, so if you have that, it's, you know, that's a, that's a huge piece of, of kind of making this all work. So, um, yeah, did that, did that kind of answer your question? Did that, that shed some light? Sorry, I was on here. Yeah, no, that's great. That's really helpful. And are um, the the resources that that you have at Sifstart are predominantly focused or only focused on U.S. Do you have any cross border interactions, Mexico, so, Canada, anything? Like that? So yeah, no, we only focus on the U.S. That's where we have our relationships. That's where we're strong. Um, now, I mean, we. Canada maybe have one community that we work with, City of Hamilton. That's probably it. And when I say work with it, I mean we have a loosely a relationship with the 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 chief innovation officer there, right? Mm -hmm. And that's about it. So mm -hmm. we so we try to say we only work within the U.S. Um, mm -hmm. when it comes to um, localities. Yeah, cool. And I see D'Angelo, you raised your hand. Yes, I'm sorry. Uh, hey guys, uh, super late here. Uh, had to go pick my son up, but uh, I'm actually commuting right now. Um, so that's why my camera is off. But anyhow, my name is D'Angelo and I'm founder of Ticket Avengers. Uh, we offer, we offer interest-free installment loans for uh, constituents to pay uh, traffic tickets or parking tickets. Um, one of the questions that I had was one, what is, what, what network, uh, is it like a specific municipalities or local governments that CivStart already have relationships with, like stronger bonds. And then also, I guess it's a two-part question. I also wanted to know, um, let's say if there is a municipality that you wanna work with, if they already have a contract in place with, a, or let's say a different merchant, is it possible for them to have two different contracts or does municipalities or local government usually work with uh, one contract? All right, so let me, parse that and answer this question let me see um so the first part of your question when it comes to network now we have you know relationships that we have built 
over the last few years and that we've built personally as well over the last decade as individuals that we have, right? Um, so we brought that all to the table. Um, but then we have also made sure that we secured partnerships with organizations that has that have the reach of those decision makers or those personas that you all will be targeting. So like the National Association of Counties, the National League of Cities, um, EOGL, those organizations we have, by extension, we have connections to their, their members um, um, through them. So that extends our reach when it comes to when we want to do certain activities or if we want to host an event. Um, we do also, you know, we have a strong relationship with eRepublic and we host our um, State of GovTech conference every year, right, in a smaller event. Hopefully it will get bigger over time, but, you know, we aim to have around 300 or so government officials come and participate in like a demo day style activity where you all get to pitch in front of these governments, but also investors, um, other stakeholders. We work with lobbying firms too that help extend um, the reach where they're in different communities, different states. Um, uh, but that's how our network works. We do also have like, I, I correct me if I'm wrong, I think we have a few thousand um, uh, people that are signed up for our newsletter. So you can correct me if I'm wrong there, Nick. Um, so, and that continues to grow. People keep signing up for it, right? And so we'll continue to have, and the majority of those people are government officials um, or some type of um, uh, someone within this ecosystem. Our goal is to build up this ecosystem as strong as possible. So we bring in all the relevant stakeholders so that we can support our startups and through, through um, um, with any challenge or through any lens um, um, while they're in our program. Um, so does that answer your question about the network stuff, D'Angelo? I can yeah, move on yeah. to the next question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that, I, I think that that's great. Sounds like you have a pretty strong network and, and, and good systems in place to uh, to uh, help startups. Yeah, and so and and then the build off, uh, and then just one last thing about the um the, the network stuff. Um, I'll just build off of what Chris was sharing about what we uh, our program that we have with the National League of Cities and Kaufman. We also started building out separate standalone ones around certain topic areas. So right now we're doing one around transportation and mobility. And we went and got eight different communities from across the country, like Minneapolis or Fort Lauderdale, or, or um, um, uh, I think Raleigh, North Carolina, maybe I'm wrong there. I think Raleigh, North Carolina is a part of that. But we went and got all those communities to be a part of this. Um, um, we, do, we will continue to do, activities like that to build up our personal networks, um, our individual networks as well. Um, and now what, answering your second question, which was around, can a government use multiple, you say multiple vendors for the, is it for the same um, problem? Yeah, like for the same service, like let's say like- Usually governments yeah. won't do that. I mean, they might, I, I can't, every, the, the, the beauty depends on their capacity of, and their yeah, budget and their needs. And the beauty of, you know, government and why it's, we, why we exist here, CivStart is that it's local government is, you know, it's not a monolith, it's confusing, it's all over the place. You've seen one county, you've seen one county, you've seen one city, they're all different, right? And so, um, to Nick's point, it all depends on capacity. Usually they don't pay for the same vendor to do, or the same solution if to solve, they don't have two solutions to solve the same problem. It's that, that, that would be redundant and someone's done a poor job at procuring a solution. But I'm not gonna say I've never seen that before because this definitely happened before. Um, but so- can I, can I add something? Yeah. I was just going to say, if your question is more like, you know, if somebody contracts with us for a transportation solution, would that same government also contract for a 311 solution? Um, that, that does happen sometimes. I mean, typically, you know, typically we will leverage connections that we have in one department 
to try and meet other people, hear about their priorities and whatnot. But, um, you know, the same kind of it depends answer always is going to apply in terms of mm -hmm. capacity, budget, interest, and all that. Yeah. Does that answer your question, D'Angelo? Yeah, yeah, that pretty much answers my question. I think that makes sense. I just, um, I was curious around that because um, I've noticed uh, quite a few times, like, uh, uh, oftentimes when you go on government websites, sometimes like you maybe uh, they have like these external links where they'll take you one place and then another place, but they both solve pretty much the same uh, problem, especially around payment processing. I've seen that uh, quite a few, quite a few times, and I was wondering how how did that work or like like you know what I mean? So yeah, yeah I, guess, I think it, yeah, I think it all depends on the solution and every and the problem, right? Like you're probably not going to see multiple you might see multiple workflow solutions that definitely happens, right? You'll see things like that, but you might not see, uh, you know, multiple community engagement platforms, but that does happen too. So it depends, right? It all depends. Um, I'm going to, Christine, your question. Yeah. 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 Sure. When you are asking how often are the meetings and can team members join, which, what meetings are you referring to? I just want to make sure that I'm going to respond to this correctly. The internal ones, the ones that are available to members. The ones that are available to, like the ones that we would have with you, is that what you're asking about? Mm -hmm. Oh, so like, yeah, it all depends. Like what we like to do is in the beginning for the first uh, uh, several months, we like to have bi-weekly meetings with the, the, the companies um, just to make sure we, you know, we build out a plan, make sure the plan is moving smoothly, make sure that we are all in agreement on deliverables, what needs to be like, what the success look like at the end of the program for you and for us that we've agreed upon so we can track and measure those metrics. Um, but, um, it all depends on your bandwidth where we can easily like move it and taper off from like, it can be bi-weekly, it can be once a month, it can be whatever, as long as we're doing what we need to do. Um, and yes, you can have any team members join the meeting or you can have designate certain team members to be the, the, the point person at the meeting and can, you don't even have, you can join the meeting when you want to, like we've had, we have different arrangements for everyone. People might say like, you know, uh, Chris might show up to a meeting and Chris might also have, a, another colleague show up to a meeting with them, or Chris might then make that meeting, have the colleagues take that meeting, depending on what they want to discuss um, that week. Is there any um, capacity for access to capital or funding for your startups? Is that a part of this program? So do we provide, are you asking, do we provide capital or do we help with it or both? Both. I'm, so more, do, I'm curious about the model itself. Yeah. Yeah. So we do help with you. We do help with securing capital. We do have a you know rolodex of investors and funders all over the place. Um, now, when it comes to us investing at the moment, we our fund is not stood up, and so that's something we're working on. Um, but so we do not invest at the moment. So we do not take equity okay. um, at the moment. I'm, I'm going to get into the model um, in a second. Um, but let me, I just see Dustin's question. Right. Does that answer your question before I move on? And then I'm going to get into the model. All right. Uh, what sort of in-person meetups are expected to take place in the next year? So good question, Dustin. We do have, we, you, you know, we have our, our demo day state of GovTech, which is we have that every year so that you all will come to that meeting. I mean, to that um, summit and, you know, have be able to showcase yourselves to government officials and investors and people there. Um, we do, um, we do provide tickets to some of these other bigger conference, like I said, like the NACO conference or, or, um, or discounts at conferences like Smart Cities Connect, or you can come to like EOGO's conference, like those things that you normally have to pay for that we will take care of for you. Um, we do um, we do have like smaller regional type of activities um, and things that we're definitely planning that we haven't done because of COVID um, in person in a while. 
Um, but the things that we are planning on doing over the next couple of years, of course, are doing like these smaller, like regional forums where we go to a certain area and we bring governments from that area together to talk about a certain issue, but we'll bring the startups that are relevant to a topic if it's around economic development, if it's around mobility and transportation or infrastructure or whatever, bring those relevant startups um, and those relevant personas to come together and talk about the issue, help you build relationships with them and be seen as a resource with those governments. Um, so yeah, that's typically the in-person meetings we have. Um, and we put together a calendar of events for you all. Like there's tons of events that you'll be able to go to through us um, and take advantage of. Now, the one thing I will say is that it's, we'll, provide you with the stuff, you have to take advantage of it. We can't force you to do it. It's not something that you have to do. But if you're like, hey, we want to build relationships with these governments. And I'm like, hey, you should go to this conference. Here's a free ticket. And you're like, oh, well, I, and you don't go. Then, you know, I try to say like, well, that was an opportunity for you to go and, you know, build relationships with people to try to get, you know, win some, uh, the, to, you know, grow your pipeline and win some opportunities. As you know, government, the way they operate when it comes to buying, it's a very relationship driven uh, market compared to all the other verticals, right? It's, they need to trust you. The, the governments are risk averse. They do not want to take chances too much on startups. And so, Hey, we do put that stamp of approval on startups um, saying like, hey, they've gone through our vetting process and everything. But B, we do give you the opportunity to be in front of them at some of these activities. And I would say you got to be there. That's the one thing is even when I used to work with the bigger companies, when I was at the National Association of Counties, I would tell them they had to be there. And they were wondering why they were losing out to some of the other companies that were there because those companies were always present. All right. Even if they were just there networking, they were always present. That official got to build a relationship with you and wanted to do business with you. Um, so does that answer your question? Perfect. Any other questions before I move on to the, the model, the, how that all works, the participation model? Okay. So the way our model works is while we do not take equity for, from you all, we do have for the two years, we do have a participation fee that, that the startups do pay. Participation fee is a 10K annual fee for the year. And we do have a um, per, uh, revenue share based on contracts you close with us during, with us during the program. And that can, while the standard starts at 15, that can change. That can always, based on your margins, based on, based on, um, um, uh, we want to make sure it's fair for you, fair for us, but we don't want to be eating into like your ability to A, make money and, and also build a working product, right? So we, we can definitely um, negotiate on that stuff, but that's what the base is for the program. Yes, so it is 10K each year, and then you roll into our alumni program, um, which Chris and company are gonna be rolling into afterwards, but for those two years, it is 10K. Um, but we still work with, like we have our first alumni program, we still work with our alumni still, like we still get everything, so. Um, but it's for these two years to stand up of a lot. There's a lot of things that we have to stand up. And again, like we pay for certain things, we'll sponsor certain events so that you don't have to worry about going and spending $25,000 at a conference. Like imagine like <laughs> a lot of these conferences are expensive. A lot of these events are expensive. So we will cover a lot of that stuff. Does that... Sorry, do you have um, just, I mean, as if we were, and I don't know if you can join, if it's a rolling enrollment or you have to join at a certain time, but like, could we get an idea of kind of like the scheduled events that you have already, sort of those sort of our, our, those benefits already in place that we would know that we would be in line for if we were to go ahead and yeah, yeah, we would definitely have that all lined up for you. Again, we would have like you would, um, when it comes to events, we would have right away when you start um, this current cohort, usually our demo day is, it happens earlier in the year, 
but this current cohort will benefit because they will be able to go to two of them right out of the gate. They will be able to go to this, uh, the 2022 one um, this fall, and then you would have yours th that where you'll be able to present and have exhibits and everything. You'll be able to have that stuff um, um, uh, in 2023. Um, then we have, um, uh, I, I don't know all the events and stuff off the top of my head, but and I can definitely share that with you. And when, and, it, and when you apply, right, we will, when you apply, and if you get, go to the interview process, we'll answer any other questions, and then we'll definitely have everything flushed out while we're going through like the contract and negotiating stuff. Like you'll have all the details of what I get what this looks like what do we need to make sure that this is successful so you won't just be applying get selected and then um and then um and then like the benefits are just dropped on you um <laughs> after everything is signed uh but if you want me to also explain just the process going forward i can explain that if that's what you're looking for as well i didn't know if that's what you were asking for um at the same time do you want me to do that yeah, that'd be great. Okay, awesome. Um, so the process going forward, um, what we'll do here is we will be, you know, our application process, we're probably going to extend it. We always do this. We always, we, we try to make sure we, and we want you to, if you can, it, it works, it, it's a benefit to you to try to get your application in as soon as possible, but we'll probably extend it a couple more weeks. Um, and then once we do that, we will, um, we have our selection committee, they'll start reviewing um, the first batch of startups that have come in. That process usually takes about a month or two for them to go through that, plus for us to set up interviews for like we'll set up interviews as the applications are reviewed. Once the applications are reviewed and we have the interview set up, we conduct, um, and Sarah, Nick, feel free to jump in on this, I believe we conduct one interview um we will then um send our we will generate a report the report then goes back to our uh, board of directors and then um we will then end up making the selections the final selections the, from the ones who made it past the initial selection committee and through the interview make the final selections um by uh i believe it's july or yeah, we make the we make them towards the middle of July. We make those final selections middle of July. We work on the contract with you over that through throughout August to make sure that we're all on the same page, that you're comfortable moving forward with whatever the the parameters are in the contract, and um, whatever the structure is, how we ever we structure the um, program, and then we make the announcement in September. And when we make the we make the announcement, we usually do it either in you know, state scoop or, or uh, um, gov tech news or whatever we do it, we do a big splash announcing all of our startups for this year. And then we hit the ground running with um, onboarding and then a few events in the beginning of the year and, and, and towards the telling of the year. And then we, um, the, I mean, the program started by then. Does that make sense? Is yeah. that really straightforward? Yep. Thanks. And Nick and Sarah, I don't know if you all want to jump in and add anything. I don't know if I missed anything there. Well, I just wanted to introduce myself since I uh, joined late coming from another call. I'm Sarah. I'm another co-founder of Civstart. Um, nice to meet you all. Good to see you again, uh, Dustin. But I think, you'd, I think, yeah, you got the process right. We definitely, you know, should you make it through the selection process and should we want to offer you a spot in the cohort, we'll definitely present you with kind of the menu of all the benefits, a snapshot of kind of what the calendar year will look like. Of course, that will change over time a little bit, um, but just kind of a general um, framework of it. And then also I'll work with you on the terms of the agreement. So things like your revenue share portion and the upfront fee we'll discuss to make sure um, that it works for you all uh, to be able to participate in the program. I've got another question. It's it's kind of related. I don't know if it is. Um, I see that several past cohort companies have been also selected as what's it called a GovTech top 100. Mm -hmm. 
How does that work? I mean, so is we, there a percentage of those that are in cohorts that get selected? Do you have influence in that? I, I mean, I'm not going to say we have influence in that, right? I'm not going to say we have influence in that. Um, we do have a, again, we have a very strong relationship with e Republic. So if we went to them and said, we would like you to consider X companies for this, they would take that into strong advisement and review it, right? Um, but because we said that doesn't mean you're going to be guaranteed a spot on there. But a lot of our companies do get selected there. I mean, we have, again, like we do try to pick, we get, you know, a bunch of applications. We try to pick the best companies out of that bunch of applications. And usually those ones are considered, you know, top companies for whatever requirements or whatever criteria they use uh, when it comes to the top 100. The reason why I'm asking is because a lot of the companies on there are multi-billion dollar companies, public like companies, you know, like, yeah, well, yeah, it's like, yeah, yeah. how can us little guys compete? <laughs> Something like that. Like City but... Gross is on there, right? Like, yeah, exactly. Exactly. That's what's small. exciting yeah. about that. Yeah. Yeah. I get it. I, I don't know their criteria. <laughs> I just know when it comes to our companies, we'll recommend, hey, take a look at these companies if you want to look at someone to add to that list. Does that also kind of work too, like as far as like PR? You know, like articles being published or case yeah. studies, or I yeah. don't know, maybe Chris, you have experience in that? Yeah, actually, I could, I could speak to that. Um, yeah, actually, one thing I wanted to emphasize earlier was actually um, the the mentors and advisor network uh, for Sivstar is like really strong, really robust. Like one um, mentor that we got matched up with was Jake Williams at State Scoop. Um, and I mean, he's just fantastic. Like, you know, me and my co-founder and, you know, our, our, we had no idea about how to approach earned media or even, you know, how to competently do social media. We were sort of like, you know, pretty uninformed and like, you know, novices there. And he was just like happy to spend time with us and say, you know, Hey, like, this is how you should structure a press release. And, you know, he'd edit, edit it with us line by line and, you know, say, okay, you know, email these five people, this press release, you know, at least a week before you want to drop it, you know, start, you know, send, say this in the email, attach this thing, um, like super nuts and bolts, like support, uh, with, with the process, um, uh, it was really helpful. Um, yeah. And so we even got, um, yeah, we got some earned media, um, out of that when we had, you know, some things to announce, we were able to kind of roll that into, um, uh, you know, some press releases and, you know, your press releases aren't always going to get picked up, but over time, you know, you're pinging these, you know, reporters and, and whatnot at, at these, all these different publications and, you know, they start to see a pattern and see some development and eventually, you know, there becomes a little bit of a story. So I think, you know, States Group ended up running a story on us on like, you know, how governments are responding to, to the pandemic to help small businesses, right? Like it was more of a overview article and it touched on a couple different cities that we worked with and like what we did and how we did it. Um, you know, things of that nature is, you know, fantastic. So yeah, I definitely wanted to like emphasize the, the quality uh, of, of the mentor and advisor network that they have. So it's, you know, maybe, maybe you don't need help with social media or earned media or things like that, but, um, you know, for whatever it is, uh, that you need help with that's relevant in this space, like, you know, whether it's earned media or trade shows, conferences, you know, the usual channels there, um, you know, they've, they've done a really good job to kind of cultivate that network and, and make it available to, to startups in the cohort. And I know we are up on time here, so I will be happy to answer any other questions, but if you have any last questions to ask Chris, this is a good time to ask him. And I can also leave my email in the chat yeah. real quick in case you think of something later, but happy to answer questions now too. Hey, gotta... you. I have a question. Go ahead. You, you sure? Oh, okay. Um, my question is about IP. How do you protect IP? And, you know, because sometimes working in local governments can be kind of competitive. Mm -hmm. And so I wonder, you know, with your members, is it just like shared information? Or if you know that more than one of your members is going after the same project or in the same focus area, is there something that protects that? Or mm -hmm. is it encouraged that they share, mm -hmm. collaborate? So we try our best. I'm not going to say we've never done it. And I can even say like, even like 
Quali is a great example. Um, we try our best not to have companies overlap with each other. We where they're remotely the same, right? And Chris, you know, like we had Gavlier, it was kind of like, uh, like yeah. even though you guys were different in the beginning, it was just like, are they different, right? All right, like in like the way the language was, right? Would eventually we realized they were different, but it was just kind of like hard at first. So we try our best not to have any overlap so that we do not run into like these conflicts of, uh, or like um, your IP getting out there to your competitors. Now, when it comes to sharing with governments, like I, that comes with the territory, right? They're going to look at it and it's up to them to decide. You can have something with them, but I don't think you're going to really go and give a government a non-disclosure. Like they're probably not going to sign at if they're going to, if you want to do business with them or anything like that. Right. I get that. That is public. That's yeah. public record. Yeah. But like, okay, so that makes sense. So really when it comes to the selection, that's where you are really determining whether the company move for, moves forward or that the startup moves forward. Yeah. So like, yeah. So like after I get through the initial selection period, then we give our recommendations and then say like, we do have similar companies to each other. Like they're like doing the same exact thing core. Right. And we give our recommendations to our board and then we just look at, okay, we will then evaluate those two to see which one is we think is the better fit. Right. And Sometimes we end up like losing out. We want both of those companies, but we have to, we can't, it just doesn't benefit for us to have two micro mobility EV companies at this in the same cohort. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We One, do have. Oh yeah. Go ahead. Oh, so, go ahead, Chris. I was just going to say one thing that I might just say about sort of other members of the cohort, like more, much more often than not. And maybe this is because, you know, you're working on sort of curating, uh, you know, diverse set of, uh, you know, startups and, and, and businesses, but we've found that it's actually like a lot more likely that you're going to find like a really good complementary mm -hmm. um, startup to work with. Like one example is um, like AI for Gov, like they're, uh, uh, they're like more of a backend service for helping um, kind of break down different silos between different legacy platforms and provide kind of better kind of access for other third party vendors, such as ourselves to those legacy platforms. So anytime that, you know, cities you know, are saying, oh, we've got you know, this big Tyler Munis system, um, but, you know, we'd love for you to integrate with it. And, you know, we know we don't want to integrate directly with that. That would be way too much work. Um, you know, we're, we're happy to sort of let, let those, you know, those folks know and, and sort of bring them into it. And there's lots of different kind of ways in which kind of the interaction um, really helps. I think over mm -hmm. time also our clients have sort of figured out um, that, you know, if they have, if they're interested at all in working with other startups, like, you know, who else do you know who does this? And this is like, you know, clients who, who might not necessarily be directly in the Civ Start network as well. Um, it's sort mm -hmm. of, um, you'll be surprised at how there's a lot more, it, the, you know, collaboration among startups in the program and the cohorts is, is a huge net positive. So I, I wouldn't worry too much about uh, comp internal competition there. What about in competition, excuse me, what about competition for talent? What's to stop me from just building my global talent pool of Civ Start members? I don't think there's uh, anything stopping you there. Yeah, I don't know. Stop, yeah. <laughs> we encourage yeah. it. Yeah. yeah, I don't know if there's anything to stop you there. Got it. Okay. <laughs> All right. I, I'm sorry. I know, Sarah, I cut you off. Dustin, were you trying to say something? I know we're really up on time here. Okay, uh, that's fine. No, that's fine. I, if, you, if it's quick, you can ask it. Um, Chris, prior to joining Civ Start and after joining Civ Start, what were some changes? What were some net positive benefits that you didn't expect? Yeah, I guess, um, yeah, it's a good question. Um, let me pull up my notes here. <laughs> it's like a lot of the things that, that sort of Anthony, Anthony hit on. I think, I think the biggest eye opener is like a lot of times, especially in this, in like the state and local government space, like it's just like Anthony said, it's so relationship driven and it's so its own thing. Like, you know, if you're selling SaaS or, or consulting services into kind of like large enterprises or medium enterprises, like it's a very different 
beast than selling into local government. Um, and there's a lot of like, you know, you don't know what you don't know sort of thing that I think the, you know, the folks at CivStart have, you know, done a lot to help us kind of demystify for us. Um, you know, a lot of, like, I would say like one of the biggest benefits that we've gotten is like really understanding sort of how to use partnerships with these like quasi governmental or like government adjacent organizations like NLC and Kaufman and, you know, US Ignite and all these things. It's like before joining CivStart, like very, I had very little awareness of that. You know, I was just like, oh yeah, like, you know, we're trying to sell into cities. I'm going to look up all the cities in this state and like, you know, try to cold call them or something. Right. But I think it's like, there's, the the partnership angle um you know going to conference and events and like being able to like make the best of those and and do those effectively it's like that's a lot of what we've learned in the program it's just like experience that would otherwise be extraordinarily expensive and and really hard won um you can get a lot more efficiently this way like i would say like even if you didn't get a single contract like directly from the the program like it would still be worth it because you'll be gaining the experience and building all these different systems of like your marketing machine and like what does your sales pipeline look like and you know how do you how do you avoid that rf going to rfp and you know help help kind of guide the government in the other direction um it's uh yeah i think it's it's, it's really demystifying the space and you know Anthony and Sarah and Nick and Jessica, they're, you know, just a wealth of, they're walking, talking encyclopedias of, of all this information. And it'll be really helpful in ways that you might not be able to anticipate, but, you know, maybe it'll be similar to, to our experience. Awesome. Thanks for that. Sure. And with that, I'm going to wrap this up. Thank you all for staying an extra 10 minutes. Um, thank you, Chris, for joining today. Um, if if any of you have any questions um, um, after today, feel free to email us. Um, you, Chris shared his email there, so you can ask him any other questions to get the, from the startup's point of view. Um, and um, yeah, just apply. I know, Hagov, hey, you've already applied. You're already done. You're already in the books. I think, I think D'Angelo, I saw your application come in already. So if, you, if you're interested, apply. Okay. Thank you Thanks, all. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Have a nice day. Bye bye.